Thanks, Mark. Uh, so glad to have everyone join us today. We know in personal finance education that there's more to it than just giving consumers the knowledge and the skills that they need. There's that some other component that people have to have to really be successful at behavior change. And one of those things that I'm really excited to hear more about today is from the field of psychology and it's positive psychology. So, so great to have Dr. Cynthia Crawford here with us. She is an extension professor professional um, and she has leadership for retirement planning and she's reached out to 30,000 University of Missouri faculty and staff on four different campuses as well as residents consumers all across their state prior to that role she was a regional family financial education specialist for more than 30 years and she's reached over 300 million people via the radio with financial management education presented more than 3,000 face-to-face workshops and classes in financial education, leadership management, and donor education to over 200,000 individuals. Long, solid history of outreach education. Uh, in more than 30 years of educational efforts, she has driven 500,000 miles, <laughs> and we can appreciate that, all over the U.S. And with the W.K. Kellogg, International Leadership Fellow, she loves to travel and claims that she can be packed and ready to leave her home in Marshall, Missouri in 30 minutes. And um, where where I come from, we we say that you load easy. That's a, a <laughs> farming term. Uh, her degrees include an undergraduate education degree uh, in, from uh, Truman State, Kirksville, and also a master's educational specialist and PhD degrees from University of Missouri, Columbia. She models lifelong education and is currently studying positive psychology. Her husband, Robert, is a retired attorney and they've been married for 40 years and have a daughter who also works in finance. She's in a financial industry regulatory authority and a son is a nuclear medicine technologist. Um, Dr. Crawford is a University of Missouri Extension faculty member, scholar, entrepreneur, business owner, radio personality, researcher, problem solver, a football fan, international traveler, cattle rancher, so you get that load easy term, and a tree farmer. She said she's happy to be here with us today, and I am so delighted to have you here, Dr. Cynthia Crawford. Thank you. Well, thank you, Laura. It's, it's a joy to get to visit with you about the work that I've been doing, uh, especially the last year and a half. Mark, that music was so fun. I had a hard time staying in my chair. I wanted to get up and dance. Uh, so thank Just you for that as well. <laughs> Let me see if I can get the screen shared correctly, and then we'll enjoy our time together looks good on on our end does it look fine yep. well let's call that good then um, I want to visit with you about the focus of my work in the last year and a half in the hour that we have together and of course I want to make it as productive as I possibly can for you thank you for being here where I think we're headed in this hour I want to uh, look at the content that was put into an online course how to get an A in retirement how positive psychology can contribute to financial education is the real heart of our presentation in this time we have together. What we've learned in the pilot year of A, I'm going to shorten the class and just refer to it as A, and how you can learn more about positive psychology. I think that we need to be building that capacity within our field. It was important, of course, that the content of the online class be researched and evidence-based and so I was given almost a year to focus on combing through the research and the best practices. Several of you on this uh, webinar have been my teachers and I appreciated that and the research that you've done. It draws, of course, from family economics and management, but also we need to practice what we know about the principles of adult education and about effective measurement and evaluation and then added positive psychology. I also draw, drew from my professional practice, and you know what I learned the most, don't you? 
it's when I don't get it right the first time. And so that's been very helpful. This all started about a year and a half ago when I was called into the dean's office, and that's not unusual, and sometimes it's good. Uh, this particular time, it did turn out to be very good. Dr. Jobert Rankin said, Cynthia, I want you to tackle what no one else has been able to successfully do. And you have one year. Don't ask for an extension. Don't um, give me excuses. Make sure it's ready to deliver in one year. And then she said, but in this year, you have the space and the professional time that you need to do what you need to do to make this happen. And I love a challenge, and so I'm very appreciative to Dr. Joe Bert Rankin for giving me that opportunity. The challenge was to forge a positive working relationship with Healthy for Life. That, that was the connection that had not been made yet, and it's obvious that it, University of Missouri Extension in Missouri and Healthy for Life have some common ground that uh, we can enhance one another's work. So my target audience for the initial work was 30,000 University of Missouri faculty and staff on our four campuses, uh, hospitals and clinics, university extension, uh, at the system level, which is our administration level. We have 20,000 benefit eligible faculty and staff and 10,000 additional uh, faculty and staff. Uh, it was defined to me to deliver an eight session online course and as it turned out that was that was just fine. Uh, there is a $50 fee and I talk to people about how it's one of the best investments they can make, not only in their, their future, which you and I think is uh, justification enough, but those that complete can double their money. And what I mean by that is if, if our faculty and staff that are benefit eligible get 400 points, they get $400 back in their insur insurance premiums because this provides enough points for a fourth of that. Uh, I, I can justify that their $50 fee can turn into $100 in their pocket. And that's one of the best investments I think a person can make uh, economically as well as, as for their future. We did some work with Healthy for Life and they quickly realized that financial well-being is a part of physical and psychological well-being. And they've gone on to be recognized nationally and that's helped our partnership as well. Uh, the financial piece is one that our faculty and staff have been most interested to learn about. In fact, today I ran an ad uh, in, in an email that goes out to all our faculty and staff and the class has been filled and that was uh, approximately two hours ago. So that's how hungry our faculty and staff are for correct, unbiased, research-based information. I would suspect that you would have developed a similar outline to mine for the financial well-being part. You may have organized it a little bit differently, but starting with goals and then module two, looking at where you are today financially, and then delving into specifics about Social Security. Uh, we have four different pension plans between Extension and our uh, faculty and staff, and so we looked at specifics of all four and helping people to identify which one uh, they're enrolled under. Uh, looking at uh, taxing matters, and not all retirement income is created the same, and, and looking at different scenarios. Saving and investing, of course, has to be a part of retirement planning. Estate planning, uh, getting people to look at insurance has always been a challenge in my career, so I kind of saved that to last, hoping that the learners trusted me enough to dive into insurance and learn the principles and also to learn uh, just how much insurance risks and insurance needs change over the life cycle. And then number the module eight is the big finish, and, and I got to put everything in that that I didn't fit anywhere else, uh, helping to look at sudden wealth, being suddenly single. Uh, most people think they're going to move, but what does the research say and how far? Uh, is it true that I can have a dramatic uh, and change in my lifestyle from going to a, a desk jockey looking at a computer to uh, being an athlete when I retire. Uh, an honest look at cognitive decline and how many times it's manifest in financial management first and more. So number eight is kind of everything else. Uh, you may go, well, what's plan P? 
Well, so often it's procrastination, and you've seen that in, in the folks you work with as well. And working to have a standard of being perfect in a retirement plan or estate plan or investments, I think is also a huge barrier. So we wanted people to move from plan P, be expecting perfect perfection in themselves or others and getting over procrastination to plan I. And plan I is taking initiative to craft uh, a future that is more like a person wants to be. Uh, the message that I have to deliver is difficult, which is realistically people need to work longer, save more, and expect less. And that's that's a tough message to carry, although I'm proud to carry that message and, and deliver it in a palatable way because I don't want people to work in academia for a career, whether it's at the university, at your institution, or the nobads that move around. I don't want people to give their life and then look up at retirement and go, no one ever told me that the realities for me are very different than my parents and certainly different than my grandparents. So that's one of the big messages. Now, as I was developing this, I realized that this is only part. This is terribly important. But there's another piece that I felt needed to be added to this. And before we go on to that other piece, I'd like to invite us to pause and uh, ask you for any feedback that you'd like to offer or perhaps a question or two about the Healthy for Life program uh, or the content and financial information. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Crawford. Uh, participants, if you could feel free to put that in the Q&A. You see the Q&A down there. If you have questions on anything that she's covered so far, feel free to, to go ahead and post those. Um, I, I did, Cynthia, have one quick question. I, I'm really intrigued by those, the kind of that last list of things that you had on the slide that you covered that talked about, uh, yes, once couch potato, always couch potato, um, cognitive decline, sudden wealth, suddenly single, moving your residence, and so those are all covered in, in this one module. Yes, and um, it, I said to our learners, if it feels like we're jumping around, it's because we're jumping around, uh, particularly in the eighth model uh, module, kind of doing everything else. But I think it's fun to ponder, and people do experience sudden wealth. Now, uh, it doesn't have to be a huge fortune to be a sudden wealth and to, to potentially have uh, at least the opportunity to make your life better, but handled poorly, there's the opportunity to be even worse off than if you'd not had a windfall at all, for example. Um, suddenly single, uh, the, the gray divorce revolution surprises many of our learners, and the idea that the divorce rate for those among 50 is increasing, while for those younger, it in many um, statistics that I look at, it's not increasing and perhaps maybe dropping. Um, so people will go, well, that really surprised me. But then I got to thinking I have two friends uh, over 50 that divorced recently, and then they start to see that um, that can be a factor. And certainly that has um, implications for people's resource base and certainly can change the retirement planning that a couple has done up to that point. Um, and and uh, I, I would guess that maybe some of those topics, too, we lean on other disciplines besides just personal finance, other disciplines in family and consumer sciences to draw some information about cognitive decline and about uh, moving from being a couch potato to being, being a, a little more of an athlete. We have a couple more questions in Q&A, if you have time for those really quickly. Uh, one is Becky uh, said she uh, Googled Healthy for Life and had a pretty overwhelming response and wondered particularly if there was something you were referencing in, uh, with your Healthy for Life materials on the next slide. Let's talk about that just a moment. Um, at the University of Missouri, Healthy for Life is, an, is a program through HR that encourages us to become physically more active. Uh, it looks at uh, nutrition, health, mindfulness. Um, a person can participate in classes. They can read books. 
uh, attending a lecture is 25 points for an hour, uh, getting a flu shot is 50 points, and the online class that, that we're discussing this morning was one of the first, it wasn't the very first, the one on mindfulness uh, was the first that I'm aware of, uh, that uh, looked at finances, and since then our Office for Financial Success uh, at the university, which is within our department, uh, has developed a wealth program where there's one-on-one -on -one counseling. I can refer to Office for Financial Success and they refer people to me. So it's developing a community of faculty and staff that are healthier, uh, in this case hopefully financially healthier, but physically and psychologically as well. And we want that to have a positive impact on our health care costs for our faculty and staff and hopefully uh, it becomes a strat one strategy uh, that we very much need at the university to control health care costs and to control the costs for health insurance for the university and for our employees. That's We've had a very difficult time uh, controlling those costs and uh, reducing the increase in costs that we've had. Great, thank you. And one, one more. Uh, what prompted your boss to want you to spend a year on this work? Was was there a buyout, perhaps? Um, I'm not aware that there was. We had a strong emphasis, and our director at the time was also uh, he he came back as a retiree and was working with the uh, retirees associations on all four campuses. One of the really positive things that this has done is it has helped our colleagues at the campus and administrative level become more well informed with what Extension is doing and that Extension is a, a vibrant part of our university and it has resources that can uh, help our faculty and staff as well as people all across Missouri. So uh, not only was it a, an education uh, effort. It was building a partnership with Healthy for Life and uh, increasing engagement with our faculty and staff and extension. So I think all of those things uh, maybe contributed to the decision to uh, give me the challenge to do this. And uh, wanted to point out that Mark Locklear put in the chat the link to your university system wellness program. So anyone who wants to take a look at that, just feel free to go go click on that link in the chat. So okay. uh, let's, let's get back to the program. Dr. Crawford, take it away. So I think the expectation was that the retirement education would be financial well-being and, and you and I would go, well, that's, that's important and, and thank goodness they realized that. But it occurred to me that what good is it to have adequate money and adequate resources for retirement without a compelling reason to get out of bed of a morning? And what is it that makes the final third of life, for many of us, the big finish that we want to be? Now, before uh, coming back to family economics, I had spent three years as director of donor education, and part of that role was to work with extension retirees and meet with them both in the spring and the fall and help keep them connected with university extension and our uh, university as a whole. And what I noticed was that some of our retirees came bouncing in the room and they said, Cynthia, this is the best part of life. I, uh, it's, it's just so exciting. And right behind them would be people that kind of drug themselves into the room and their facial expression was different and they would quietly um, and, and more often than I would have anticipated people came up to me and said the equivalent of Cynthia retirement just isn't that great it's just it's just kind of a disappointment and so I was pondering what what makes it the the best third of life for some and a huge disappointment for others and I started thinking about how well-being is more than money, and it certainly helped. I, at that point, was uh, doing a study of positive psychology uh, just for my own, my own love of learning and because I thought it, it uh, was something I very much wanted to learn over the years and had wished for because I suspect many on the webinar have had the same experience I am. You're doing financial counseling. Somebody comes up to you after a workshop and you know that 
the issue they're talking about is has to do with their finances but the root of the problem is something much deeper it may be a relationship problem it may be an impulse problem it may be a lack of self-esteem and it's uh, they're trying to buy self-esteem and of course that doesn't work and so um, the time was just right to begin looking at how does positive psychology contribute to financial education and to even greater well-being. Ed and Robert Biswa's Diner, our father-son group, in 2008 they started writing and researching psychological wealth and of course you throw in the word wealth and that gets our attention. Uh, they defined it as the experience that our life is excellent, that we're living in a rewarding, engaged, meaningful and enjoyable way and as I was looking at their work a few weeks ago I thought oh this is what people want when they describe um, their vision for retirement. Just this morning, I was enjoying a cup of coffee and looked at the Think Advisor uh, email that comes in about every morning. And they were announcing that financial well being is more than finances. Uh, according to Morningstar, a person who is both economically sound and emotionally well is not financially healthy. Now, they're kind of coming from a deficit model, and I, I want to, in positive psychology, suggest another approach. But uh, the article went on to say that traditional definitions of financial wellness focus on economics. A finance only definition assumes that emotional well being will automatically follow, uh, according to Morningstar's research, and that's specifically Sarah Newcomb. The research shows otherwise. And so uh, there are others, uh, and I want to talk about some good work at the uni at K State University. There are others that are beginning to think about how positive psychology, or in this case, psychology, interfaces with financial effectiveness and well being. And so I hope one result of this uh, webinar is you'll start to notice the discussion that's uh, picking up more and more about how this dynamic may enhance um, both and cut both directions. Well before I go any further it's really important to me to recognize that I didn't do this work in isolation and that I had the the good judgment to find partners and invite them to do this work and in every case I got a yes. Whenever I asked for help people said yes and I appreciate that and, and several of you are on this webinar today. Uh, I teamed up with Brianna Johnson who is a human environmental sciences instructional designer at our college. Her role is to help people be more effective at online, to be centered, and to integrate technology into the education process. Uh, she loves financial education and this got her interest and she of our greatest advocates in addition to being absolutely critical in taking the content and moving into, into Canvas, which is the platform that we use and she's available on a daily basis uh, should there be uh, technology questions that I have. This is a list of people that it's a privilege to have as colleagues and each one of them contributed substantially. Laura, you asked the question about uh, did this draw from other subject matter within HES and beyond and the answer is yes. For example, Marsha Alexander uh, made a huge contribution in selecting and rehabbing housing for retirement. And uh, one learner said, it just happens we're building our retirement home right now and we've already changed the width of some of the doorways and reconfigured the hallway in case we have to be in a wheelchair or use a walker short term, we can still function in our new home and we simply wouldn't have thought about this without, without this class. Uh, Vivian Anderson is on. Uh, Vivian and I have worked on Suddenly Single and, and teaching about sudden wealth and how to deal with both of those and both of them are challenges. Carol Bosworth, Kelly Hathman, uh, Renetta Gallup it, who was administrator in our pension plans and University Extension at the time, Suzanne Gelman, Janet LaFawn on insurance estate planning making money count, Graham McCauley, Jennifer Edding, Brenda Proctor, Tamara Robbins, Deidre Thomas, Andrew Zumwalt, all people that said yes when I asked them to work on 
uh, piece with me. I also knew that it was going to be important that we have uh, both men and women as presenters, um, some diversity, uh, just the difference in voices as we did video clips added a lot of interest uh, by having a variety of people. So thanks to these folks. Here's another list of wonderful people. Um, it was important to have this reviewed thoroughly. Uh, at the campus level, Dr. Deanna Sharp in the FFE Department, Family Financial Education Department at Mizzou, and Corey Elfrink from Positive Psychology took a close look at it. And then I'm grateful to external reviewers who all said yes. Um, they came from journalism, executive assistants that know about commas and far more about capitalization and punctuation than I'll ever know. I'm grateful to Dr. Barbara O'Neill, who took a hard look at it, Leah Satterfield, and Joe Schulmacher of Montana State University. Every one of these people made the online work so much better as a result of uh, their contributions, so thank you. The course starting points, um, some fundamentals. We were encouraging participants to be captain of their team, not to be the Lone Ranger, but to be captain not to be overwhelmed, and to take action. Today is better than tomorrow, and that knowing is not enough. Uh, it is the action solutions that people take as a result of the different modules that makes their retirement better. Retirement planning is more than money. One of the things that we challenged ourselves to do and we asked the participants to hold us to this standard is to be able to explain the course comment in plain English and to send us back to the drawing board if we did not do that. Many people can describe easily what they're retiring from. We want them to be able to describe easily what they're retiring to. Uh, once they conclude their working years and sign the papers as well. So those were kind of starting points for this work. Hope for the best is not a retirement plan. And again, I, I try to hammer on people that procrastination is just not a good answer when it comes to retirement planning. Taking action is, even uh, if it's not perfect, uh, it, it is something is better than nothing when it comes to retirement planning. So I want to, we, we've kind of agreed on the, the content for financial education and, and we all share an enthusiasm and a background for that piece. What I want to focus on now is positive psychology and I'm going to give you just enough hopefully to whet your appetite so that you too may want to learn more about it. I've got a 12-minute strategy, a two-hour strategy, and a two-year strategy and and uh, usually I'm a really happy person. Today I'm particularly happy because yesterday I turned in my final project for my uh, positive psychology graduate certificate. So I can now check that off of my bucket list. Uh, but I often wished for a background in, in psychology. Uh, positive psychology uh, graduate work for me was very helpful. I read a, a paragraph about uh, what Mizzou is doing and uh, just kind of felt called to look into it and have spent the last two years working on it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our colleagues from Kansas State University. Um, I had just gotten a good start in the studies and along came this paper uh, by Sarah Asbedito and Martin Say. And Sarah now is at Texas Tech making a contribution there. Uh, in financial education. Their paper, From Functioning to Flourishing, Applying Positive Psychology to Financial Planning, was published by FPA, and I got to participate in a webinar. And I'll give you a more complete site to find their paper at the end of this presentation. Positive psychology is relatively a new field. It was started in just 1998. So when you look at the research, uh, the research base has been since 1998, so it's very current. Uh, it is science-based, and that's important to us in extension. Um, Martin Seligman is often credited with being the father of positive psychology. In 1998, he was chair of the American Psychological Association. 
It's the scientific study of what enables individuals and organizations to thrive. Now, traditional psychology, sometimes you're looking at problems, issues, deficits. Positive psychology says, and, and I'm certain this is true of, of the audience we have on the webinar, you're doing well. You're absolutely doing well. But what if we could find ways that you could dial up your well-being to be even a little bit higher? Would that interest you? And, and most top professionals just go, yes, I would be interested in that. Well, that's positive psychology. It's helping people that do okay dial up their well-being just a little bit more. So it's strengths-based. You know, I'm never going to be a ballerina. I can't draw. And positive psychology says, Cynthia, why do you even bring that up? You can't do everything well. Just accept that and do more of what you do well because you will enjoy that. Don't torture yourself trying to draw. Go buy a picture and hang it on the wall. You don't have to paint that picture. Do more of what you do well. Accept that you don't do everything well and move from a fixing on uh, your weaknesses to building on your strengths paradigm. Here's a big one that uh, comes up frequently in the online class and I think is helpful to people. Uh, accept that the past can't be different. You've had clients, and I have too, that want to tell you how they made a, ma a financial mistake 20 years ago, how their divorce 15 years ago changed their financial future. One of the things we need to do is accept that the past can't be different. It is what it is and to be present focused. I can't change the past. I can only ruminate on it and that, that doesn't change things. I can be present focused though and I can look at what I can do today to make my future even more positive. You'll often hear uh, PERMA in positive psychology. As they looked at the research, these are the things that make a positive huge difference in dialing up well-being and it's, it's abbreviated as PERMA. So how to get an A in retirement is, if we look back at that content list, it looks at positive emotions, it looks at engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. That's what PERMA stands for. I want to look at each of those just a little bit closer. Forgiveness is part of positive psychology, and I made a point to include that and again that was based on the three years when I worked with retirees closely and I saw what kind of baggage people carried into retirement uh, from their working years uh, because of a reluctance to forgive and I want to talk about that again but before we do that let's catch our breath and I would like for you to take a quick assessment. This is one that's within one of our modules. Positive psychology likes to do quick, uh, valid and reliable assessments. I think it'd be fun for you to look at what is your relationship with your job today? There are 10 questions and you might just keep a running total. Um, give yourself a five if you agree with the statement, four if you slightly agree, three neutral, two slightly disagree or one disagree because your relationship with your job today may influence when uh, or how you choose to retire. So let me be still and let's do something more important which is have you take a look at your relationship with your work today. Laura, since I can see you, why don't you give me a thumbs up when you get through it, and that kind of gives me an idea of what a reasonable length of time is.
Okay, Laura's through. Well, what would be one way to interpret this quick assessment? This comes from Robert Biswa Diner's uh, work on uh, positive psychology coaching used with his written permission. If you were in the 40 to 50 range, you likely find much about your job that is meaningful, likable, and enjoyable. And it kind of depends on how my week has gone, where I might fall in this, but most of the time I would go, I really feel lucky, lucky to do this work. Uh, 21 to 39 is the average rating. Many people who score within this range have some complaints about work. Uh, sometimes they feel disappointed with their jobs or just wish they could get more of a sense of purpose from work. 10 to 20, this is the lower range. Many people who score in this range are dissatisfied with their work. They often think about the weekend or other time away from the office and they wish they could find a more rewarding job. So that would be an example of a quick assessment that uh, draws from positive psychology. The people that have taken this class so far say, say lots of wise things, and here was one. There's a lot more to retirement than just not going to work. Well, that's true, and so much of what is in A is about starting now in the le years leading to retirement. I don't say, you know, once you sign the papers, consider doing these things or begin doing these things. Well-being in the years leading to retirement can build the kinds of strengths that can just be huge also in retirement to keep well-being as high as we want to be. I, I keep urging people not to wait and to uh, replace procrastination with action solutions. Well, let's take a closer look at some of the aspects of positive psychology. Uh, one is positive emotions. And it's getting beyond happiness. Um, I learned that positive psychologists kind of cringe when they see this happy face. There's nothing wrong with it. But we need to realize that happiness comes and goes. Uh, Laura mentioned that I'm a rabid Mizzou Tigers fan. And it's sure a lot more fun to drive home after the Tigers have won than if they didn't. I'm a little happier. I'm a little happier on payday than I am a week before payday when, when uh, the checking account is getting low. Uh, I'm not very happy if I would crack my elbow or stub my toe on this desk, but those things don't really ding my well-being. So happiness fluctuates far more than positive emotions and well-being. And the goal is uh, not to be happy or, or Pollyanna by any means, uh, you'll certainly feel a range of emotions, but when you can, dial it up to be on the high side and, and broaden and build on positives like gratitude, uh, being in tune with nature, sharing laughter, being inspired by others, experiencing love. I love that my uh, home office has the biggest picture window in it that they that they sell and it overlooks nature. That That helps my professional day when I'm working in that particular office. Uh, if you're curious about this, read some of the work by Barbara Friedrichsen and her research on building positive emotions and positivity. Michael Chetsumihai uh, do, does uh, a tremendous contribution in the work of engagement and research. Uh, compare these two retirees, and I've met them and, and many versions of them. One says, you know, I don't know when I ever found time to go to work. There's just so many interesting things to do compared to one that comes in and says, Cynthia, these retirement years are just hype. I don't know how to fill my time. Well, Chitsun Mihai talks about focusing uh, in engagement on a variety of things, one of which is flow. Flow is being so involved and so interested in what you're doing that you lose sense of yourself and of time. And, and I suspect you've had this happen both at work and in your leisure time that you go, I'm going to work on this for 20 minutes. I'm going to sit down and get started. And then you look up and it's two in the morning or two hours have passed and it seemed like 20 minutes. That's an example of flow. And whether it's the years leading to 
retirement or beyond, the more you can put yourself in a situation that's so interesting and so connected with who and what you are that you lose sense of time, the more it dials up your well-being. We also talk in this module about uh, engagement can be giving and, and whether it's work, wealth, or wisdom, making uh, volunteer efforts and the giving of resources more deliberate and less impulsive can add to engagement. Relationships, we think um, I don't have anybody that argues with me that relationships aren't important, but sometimes we're not very good at relationships. We're not very good at listening. We're not very good at giving time and attention to people. Uh, we're giving more time and attention to the electronics in our life than the people in our life. I'm concerned that it won't be too long before we will feel uncomfortable seated in the same room when we feel very comfortable communicating via webinar or our cell phones. Uh, Harvard does, has done a remarkable study, uh, a longitudinal study of adult development over 75 years, and that study continues today. Uh, Dr. Waldinger is the current uh, researcher with this project, and there's a marvelous uh, YouTube video uh, if you're interested in more details. The clearest message is this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier. That social connections are really good for us. Many times we have them and they're plentiful in our working years. Uh, in retirement, we need to be deliberate about replacing our workmates with playmates and he makes a key point that loneliness kills that the quality of relationships uh, matter that high conflict marriages are bad for health that you can be in a marriage and be tremendously lonesome and that living in the midst of warm relationships is protective uh, they don't protect only our physical health they protect our brain as well and so uh, that I think is is fascinating to think about and then to assertively work to strengthen those those relationships meaning uh, so often you see two deck chairs and these are two that I photographed on the strand walk uh, in Manhattan Beach recently and I like the chairs because they're empty uh, I was hoping that the people that own this are out and about uh, doing things that are meaningful to them and when they do need to rest they've picked a place that they dearly love and they're comfortable uh, enjoying the ocean. How do retirees use their time? Well I have good news and bad from Dr. Charlene Kalinowski, Texas Tech University and her graduate student. Uh, I was reading her report and emailed to her and, and asked a few questions and she said, Cynthia, the really good news is that you finally get to get enough rest and sleep in retirement. You can turn off that uh, alarm clock. You can get rid of it if you want to. Uh, people on average in retirement rest, or actually sleep, eight and a half hours a day on average. So that's the good news. But I also found some bad news in her study of time in retirement. What is the second greatest use of time uh, among the retirees in her study? Well, you may go, it's time with grandchildren. It's time being out and about with people. The second greatest use of time, almost four hours a day passively watching TV. And if you do the math, seven days a week, that's 28 hours. Let's, if you'll allow me, I'm going to round that to 30. That's three quarters time FTE, passively watching TV. That's a couch potato. And that's a lost opportunity. Um, she said, basically, a retiree's any day allocation of time looks a lot like workers' allocation of time on the weekends. So I want you to think back to what you did this past weekend. Or I'm going to look forward because I have a really fun weekend planned. I'm headed to the airport. And Laura, it will take me just 30 minutes to pack. I'm headed to the airport tomorrow to spend uh, a fun time with uh, friends this weekend. You will have about 50 hours of time to replace that you spent working and commuting to work, getting ready for work, working at home on work, you, you 
for many of us that's more than 50 hours, you've got 50 hours to fill with a different meaning in retirement. So there's some questions that, that I ask people to think about now that could be used on the weekend. Um, but in retirement, what is going to get you out of bed every morning? You need a reason to get out of bed. How will you make a difference in retirement just as you're making a difference today? How will you continue to do that? And what will you do, be, have, and contribute in retirement? Uh, a lot of times in our goal setting, we're asking people in the modules, what do you want to do, be, have, and contribute? Uh, not only in retirement, but in the time uh, leading to retirement. I think those are important questions for people to think about. Accomplishment is the A in PERMA. Uh, we have been trained, many of us, to ask the question, what is the best use of my time right now? Or when I'm at work, it's what would my employer say is the best use of my time right now? And that should direct what we're focusing on. Well, maybe the question can change and maybe you can try it on this weekend. What is the happiest use of my time right now? That may change what you choose to do. Uh, you get to choose what you define as accomplishment, uh, more so in retirement. It can be doing things like expressing gratitude, savoring your accomplishments and strengths, appreciating your contributions, uh, project appreciation for future accomplishments. You know, you're not done when you sign the paper. You have new opportunities. And savoring accomplishments and strengths in retirement. This weekend, I'm going to celebrate the accomplishments of one of my friends, and that's going to make me feel great as well. Management in retirement, and some of the uh, literature I'm reading today says that perhaps we need to think less about managing time and far more about managing our attention and our energy. Positive psychology makes the point that multitasking was never a very good idea. And what it does is it kind of fries your mind and the connections going on up there uh, and adds a great deal of stress that may be unnecessary uh, as compared to being present oriented, working on one thing completing it or completing it to the degree possible before going on to the next thing. I've always laughed and said I have a one-track mind and positive psychology suggests maybe all of us need to think more about staying on one track at a time as opposed to multitasking. So that's the A in PERMA. And then I wanted to add a section on forgiveness, which is drawn from positive psychology that, in my professional opinion, was critical to include. Um, at the time of retirement, if you'll watch, uh, many people that have, have loved their work start to have some mixed feelings. And it feels like that all of the hurts and all of the resolve matters kind of ball up and come to the surface during the somewhat emotional time of uh, process of retiring for many of us. So I felt it was critical to include. We have all had supervisors who've had bad days and who have made bad decisions or decisions that were far from perfect. We've been treated poorly by volunteers on some days or students or administrative assistants or the IT staff or the athletic director or the provost, or you can add to that list as well, uh, because we're working with imperfect human beings at an imperfect university. But let's be quick to agree too that we've done hurtful things, that we've made bad decisions, we've negatively impacted on others uh, unintentionally, and it's impacted on us as well. Well, we can, we can pick up all this baggage and we can carry it into retirement with us. We can spend time ruminating and thinking about what was unfair and who we disliked in our early years of retirement. Uh, we can become so angry and so bitter by doing this that we tell the university to code our records, do not contact. And at the university, that means you don't want any more, con send me the check and nothing else in retirement. 
uh, I've watched people do that and people that I had a, a distinguished career and and were uh, tremendous in their roles and positive people and then years later they come back and complain that the university has forgotten them that they aren't kept informed and my question is always who disconnected from whom who asked that the communication ceased uh, I like the the phrase from Anne Lamont's book not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. It can be that destructive to us. And so learning to forgive can be an important skill. Now, when you forgive, I, I appreciated learning this from positive psychology. It isn't saying that the other person or your employer was right. It isn't justifying or condoning what happened. It's saying, look, the past can't be different. We've, we've talked about that in our hour. Forgiveness is acknowledging that you've decided to forgo anger and resentment and that any future relationship with the party will be more on your terms. Now that's something that I can live with and I was glad to learn more about it and then I think pre-retirees um, find this to be very helpful. Well let's pause again and see if there's any feedback you know your perspectives are at least as important as mine and and maybe think about a question or two uh, on the positive psychology piece that we've we've covered and then uh, i'll wrap up quickly with what we've learned so laura to you okay thanks cynthia so we have a, a couple of questions uh maybe not specifically focused on the positive psychology okay. aspects, but do please put your questions in the Q&A if you have them about the content we've just covered. The couple of questions I have in here are, uh, first of all, how long are the eight sessions? So um, I'm thinking I have the same question, What? how long are, is each module? How much time does it take to complete this course? Okay, well, let's all chuckle because we're among economists and the answer is, it depends, right? On the one hand, uh, if someone has a strong background in financial education, uh, if this is something they've thought about, learned about before, uh, they may be able to spend one or two hours and do a, a perfectly good job. If they've done some planning already, that's a time saver. And some people go, well, I got through that awfully quickly. And I go, hey, that's the payoff of the work that you've done before you got to this class. The average person tells us in our evaluation they spend two to four hours on each module. Okay, so two to four hours per module, so two, and then multiply that times the eight modules. Right, so uh, they're spending about 30 hours learning. I do have some people that are spending uh, over six hours, and I think that's a little much. I have some, we, we have some people, talented, gifted people in their role at the university that are very uncomfortable, uh, that maybe bring some baggage into financial education that, that kind of shuts them down when they're working on the class. And so six hours is too much, but we do have some people that do that. So it, it ranges. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, is this open to other people? Can non-Missouri employees take the course? Where we're at in our work today is um, there's a there's a big meeting next week. In fact, Extension Nexus is an important initiative uh, within my university of delivering online. And so uh, I have rewritten this this class. Uh, we will need to redo some of our videos, and we will begin delivering it to people in Missouri. Now you go, well, why people in Missouri and not Kansas? We love Kansas, Elizabeth. Uh, my kids are driving through there today. Uh, it's because the tax discussion uh, on state taxes would be different for different states. Also, estate planning is state planning, so that's state specific. specific. Uh, if it's possible, we could do some work with those two sections to make them more generic, but I, I like to make the information as specific as possible. And so by the end of the year, now my Nexus colleagues say by August 1, we'll be delivering this across Missouri to the public. Uh, I'm saying by the end of the year for sure. So yes, it's in transition and there is certainly possibilities uh, 
to go beyond that, but we'd have to look at making the state income tax and the state planning more specific. Hey, let me wrap up and then we'll use the rest of our time for um, discussion or uh, we can certainly visit after today. Um, so the online education is something I wanted to talk about as well. Um, my goal was to make it not only high tech, but high touch so that they felt a relationship with me and our other presenters. Um, it's written first person, uh, again, is in an effort to uh, connect with people, to talk with them. Um, for most people, and this kind of surprised me, for most of our faculty and staff, well over 50%, this is their first online class. And I think it's important not only for the content, but to have that experience of learning, because we know that's, that's going to become greater all the time. Uh, some people work on it at work that we're not really encouraging that, but that's 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 their decision. I have others that work at two in the morning. I have one man that uh, must be an early riser. He brews a cup of coffee and spends 30 minutes every morning on a lesson, he tells me. And when he gets to the end of the lesson, he starts through it again until the next one is released. We release them once a week. Uh, our learners like to get them on Friday, so that's when we uh, release them. Uh, I monitor it seven days a week because I think the more interested I am and the quicker I get back to people, the, the more they stay interested in the class. And the good news is there is IT support. I don't have to worry about that. Well, what we've learned, uh, if, if you look at the actions or the non-actions of people, is that faculty and staff at the University of Missouri are immortal. Uh, now, I think we know better, but so many of them have not done any estate planning. And if they're not immortal, at least they will be dying on the same day as their spouse or partner. Uh, one of the uh, components in Lesson 8 that Vivian Anderson and I team up to talk about is what happens when you go from having a partner to being alone. And um, many people find that section to be really startling and a bit uncomfortable. Well, I'd rather them think about it today when they're feeling well and it's a pretty sunny day, at least here in Missouri, as opposed to waiting till someone's ill or having a crash course after they've lost the partner and when they need to be grieving instead. Uh, certainly a person can be gifted in their field and not in personal finance. Uh, people are surprised by the great divorce revolution. Um, I think it's important with faculty and staff, just like our clientele, we need to catch them when they're at a teachable moment. And one person that I counseled out pretty fast uh, said, you know, I had no idea that introspection would be a part of retirement planning. I don't really want to do that. And I said, you know, when you do, this course will be waiting for you but I'm not sure this is the best use of your time today because retirement planning, it seems to me, particularly when, when you add the uh, positive psychology to make it more holistic, requires rummaging around in your mind and rummaging around in your heart both um, to uh, do planning. Some more lessons that, and here's one that I didn't anticipate. I thought people would be tickled when the class was over and I went away. Um, I, they don't miss me, by the way, but they do become stressed and they express uh, that they're stressed when the course closes and they no longer have access to the information. And what they're telling us is that they value this information and uh, some are copying and pasting it. Some are asking to have longer access. Uh, because of this, we're looking at maybe printing a book or an ebook so that people aren't stressed when they no longer have the class. On the other hand, uh, the realities in Missouri and perhaps in your state are, are that we need to generate fees. And so we can't just give people this class and tell them to give it to all their friends and neighbors and, and uh, talk about the ripple effect. We, we need to uh, have some control over being able to generate fees and, and recoup some costs. Most uh, sign up to get the 100 points, frankly, and, and many people signed up this morning for that reason. And then they expect the financial content, and they're kind of surprised by the positive psych. And then they get to uh, be so interested in the content that the 100 points becomes less important to them. And I always kind of celebrate that. Um, people are fearful of living longer than their money. They're particularly misinformed or uninformed about Social Security retirement benefits and claiming strategies, and they love learning about it.
Well, I could, I could talk more and more about how uh, proud I am of my colleagues that have taken this class. Uh, if you're interested uh, in the evaluation things and some comments, uh, Laura, you're going to post this so you can go back and review this PowerPoint and find this. I hope, though, you're ready to learn more about positive psychology. In 12 minutes, there's a fun YouTube, now get ready to laugh, uh, by Sean Acor, The Happiness Advantage, that's on YouTube. Spend 12 minutes. He'll introduce this topic to you. Two hours. Start to digest the, uh, the paper from our colleagues at Kansas State University. It's in the Journal of Financial Planning, November 2015. Two hours, take the graduate certificate from Mizzou. Uh, you don't need to come to Columbia. Uh, it's all online. Take uh, one class a semester. Uh, I've seen people take two. I don't know how they do it and work full time. Um, you can look at our valuations when this is posted and the comments. Uh, I'm hoping that, that this all matures into uh, a field we might call positive financial well-being, building on strengths, helping people be forward-looking and realizing that the past can't be different, being captain of their team, taking action solutions and putting them in place, being present and building on positive actions and positive emotions. So I think that's a good place to conclude. Um, here's my email. It's been my privilege to get to talk with you this morning and to be your colleague uh, for many years. I hope our paths cross again. And let me turn it back with my appreciation, not only to you folks, but to Laura Hendricks and Mark Locklear for their leadership in this presentation. Thank you so much. Our, our, our hour is up. A couple more questions. I think you answered most everything. And uh, let's see, it looks like it is, uh, is self-paced and you mentioned the certificate. We had someone ask about that. Other books and resources that were recommended, you listed those. If you have additional resources, Dr. Crawford and I would be happy to put, add those as a document on the Learn event so people can look at that. Great presentation we have in the Q&A and it was, I, oh, I just you. applaud that so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Thank over you. to you, anything else, Mark? Nope, that's all. Just uh, as you mentioned, we'll have some uh, event materials on the learning event. Also, a, a copy of the recording, a link to the recording will be there too. So feel free to share this uh, information with other uh, colleagues or friends that may not have been able to join us. Okay, next time, May 24th, the topic is overindulgence. Same link, same time. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.